Now we're going to move on to our... By the way, the example was sort of the sixth property, which states that if two, if you have this equation with the two state with the two uh, vectors being non-parallel or non-zero, you have to equate it to the, the coefficients into the zero in order to have this statement hold correct. So now we're going to move actually to our seventh property, which I mentioned at the very beginning when I was talking about position vectors. Now, what I said back then is that when you have a vector small letter a, that usually stands for OA. And when we talk about OA, we're talking about the vector from the origin O to the point A. And that would make the be the position vector of point A. So technically speaking, if you have a point A and you want to know its position, you take that position relatively to your origin. So if you want to go from your origin somewhere and reach it A, the only straight line you will have is this one. And the direction will be this way because you're going from the origin to A. So OA would be called the position vector of point A. And you can do the same for any point. You can have position vector of B or C of D you can have a position vector of anything as long as it starts from your from your your origin point and end there this proves very important because if you want to find a vector ab ab then it's simply this uh, you want you what you're saying is you're going from a to o and then from o to b because those would cancel out and in order to do so you're technically taking the negative position vector of point a plus the position vector of point P, B, and that would lead you to finding AB. So if you're given in a question point, uh, the position vectors, you can easily find, find the actual resultant. So the position vector of point, uh, point, any point A is the vector of A, where O is the origin, and we write it and we represent this as a small letter A, this as a small letter B, this is a small letter C, and of course don't forget your arrows because those indicate what, you, what you're talking about to your examiner. Never forget them. So yes. That would simply sum up the position vector very shortly and very easily, and that would be our seventh property. Our eighth property, again, I've already mentioned, which is the modulus. Also, as I said, a modulus is also known as the magnitude, or the quantity, or the length, or the distance, or the length, or the dis distance, or any such thing. It can, uh, it's, as long as it just leads to a certain number, or a certain value, that would be our modulus. If we have any vector here, what we know is that it has an i value and it has a j value. And we know that those two are perpendicular to each other and that gives us a right triangle and we know the leg and the other, the first leg, we know the second leg and we can easily calculate the hypotenuse using the Pythagorean theorem. So we use Pythagoras in order to find our modulus. Now, I want to state something here that you might cross in your books, that when you do that, you're going to technically just uh, find, again, the square root of AI. Although, if you have, oops, let's say this is 3, this is 2. So you're going to do here, oops. So this is 3, this is 2, you're going to do 3 squared plus 2 squared, and you're going to get the square root here, which is 9 plus 4, 13, which is radical 13. If this actually had a z factor, a k factor, sorry, this is going to be 3, 2, 4, for instance. You do the exact same thing, where you're going to say it's 3 squared plus 2 squared plus 4 squared, in order to get your modulus of your 3d vector and this will give you uh, I think 13 plus 16 is 29 so radical 29 and that would be your modulus now for representation I want you to know that your way you state it here is that you are this is if this is your vector a let me use a different color so you know you don't get lost oops so if this was your vector a, actually, what you're going to do is, 
you're going to say that for vector a, its modulus, which is written as this, v2, this thing is called modulus. It is called absolute value. And so it actually indicates the absolute value sometimes, but it uh, also indicates the modulus in other times. And in our situation, it is giving us our magnitude, which is this. So our magnitude for vector A is radical 13. So our modulus A is actually radical 13. And remember, here we're talking about the length. It cannot be negative. This is why it's also in an absolute value, although you will never get a negative because you're squaring here and then you're finding the square root. It's always positive, but just to keep in mind, we're talking about length, so it's always positive. Now we're going to move to our last part and our last property, which is called the unit vector. Now, what is a unit vector? As we said, we just spoke about modulus, and it actually relates to this. A unit vector is one with modulus. Let's say we have a unit vector v. It is one with a modulus equal to one. Now, if we want to draw our a vector, and then we want to draw our d vector, and we want it to be exactly like on a, so you're going on the i1, and then you're going on the j1, 1 and 1, in order to get your modulus equal to 1, so it's square root of, oops, it's actually i plus j, so what you're going to do is you're going to add a 0 plus 1 squared, or you're going to be 1 squared plus 0 squared. So in other words, when we're talking here about a unit vector, what we're saying is, it is either going one unit to the right only, or we're only going one unit to the top. It is something with a magnitude equal to 1. And in order for us to reduce a into this, we know that the magnitude of a is radical 13. How do we turn radical 13, we want to multiply it by a certain value k, in order to get 1? This k is simply going to be 1 over radical 13. In other words, in order to turn a vector into a unit vector, you're going to divide its magnitude, uh, you're going to divide it by its magnitude. So here, uh, our a is going to be divided by radical, I, yeah, is going to be divided by radical 13, and this will give us a unit, the unit vector. It is this simple. You just uh, need to ha find the vector whose modulus is actually equal to 1. Uh, I'm going to give you an example here. Uh, which example is this? This is example number 5 uh, that relates to property 9. And our example states the following. Uh, we are What we're given is we have a vector A. Let me write it down. So you have... Oops. <laughs> vector a and it has a magnitude of 20 write down a vec a unit vector that is parallel to a a unit vector that is parallel to a should have the same the, the i to j ratio which means we can maintain the a and in that we're going the answer is going to be a the vector a divided by its magnitude 20. This is how simple the questions are, how simple answering it is. And by that, we would conclude our properties for unit vectors, for vectors in general.